podcast. Woo! Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Let's get this going. Woo! What's up, people? Welcome to Creative Theory Podcast, the show that brings you conversations with visual artists about how they got to where they got, what their day-to-day is like, what their struggles are, their thoughts, their... Um, I guess relation with the art world and a lot more. Today is a really special one because we got two artists in the studio and I've never done that before, but I think it's going to be extra awesome. And um, uh, they got a show coming up where I'm sure we're going to chat about, but first, I think I want to make an introduction. I think we'll do it in alphabetical order. I was trying to figure out how to do it. So, all right, she is a creative project based artist working with printed uh, matter in flat sculptural and performance manners. Uh, also, interesting fact, non-regular faculty at Emily Carr University Art and Design. Very awesome. And um, I was trying, I think I should describe your work. And I, um, there's a really beautiful um, balance of detail and then these uh, quiet spaces within it, within the collage work, which I uh, think is really, uh, the, the balance is quite beautiful. And her archives, research, and print and matter aim to place historical content within her contemporary visual art practice. Amy Andy Brown, how did I do? Was it good? Did That's I? fantastic. I was, I was prepping, I was prepping, I think. Okay, sweet. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much. Julie. And our second guest is a Vancouver mixed media artist, primarily working with painting and collage. Uh, her for- work focuses on uh, geometry, territories, perception, and cartography. And um, one thing I found that was interesting, and I, uh, I've seen this artist work before, but um, recently she's having pieces that are not just collage and they're... Um, uh, primarily painting but the cool thing is that the geometrical elements that were being read within the collage work there were like these beautiful tile shapes now they're translating into these painted shapes but with a seems like a more emphasis on design the compositions are really uh, clean and beautiful so I suggest you look up this yeah. artist <laughs> also uh, stylistically her work is part abstractions and part design objects that aim to create conversation of uh, modes of perceiving land and space what do you think? Yeah, that, that's amazing. Thank leaker. you so much. Uh, no, you're, you're welcome. I was, uh, I was trying to yeah, hope that I did you justice. And uh, in fact, if, peop- uh, if people are wondering why we got two collage uh, artists in the studio, there's a show coming up uh, the, on June 2nd at uh, South Main Gallery called In Situ, along with two other artists. We got, uh, uh, let me know uh, if I get this right, Julia Croats. Yep, that? that's and right. And then yep. we got Julia. Jesse McNeil. Yes. Absolutely. Good. Yep. Well, uh, thank you so much for making the studio. Let me figure out if the sound is correct here before we continue. I think we're all good. I just like I hear myself so much, but I think we got this. So uh, I think I want to talk about the art show in a bit. But the way I thought we would start this and uh, uh, let me know how uh, it's going to go. I want to make sure that we maybe talk a little bit more about the collage medium itself, because I realize I actually never. Well, I don't know that many artists that work primarily with collage. So this is very exciting for me. And um, the medium itself uh, seems pretty curious because it's been used for so many movements, right? Whether it was like uh, Dadaism or minimalism or, I mean, found art in itself, I guess, is a uh, movement on its own. So my question to you would be to start out, how do you uh, find yourself within this uh, art world beyond the title as a collage artist? Do you... um, uh, does something else uh, stay true to the style that you pursue? I guess, Amy, if you want to start first, and then we'll just keep it going. Yeah. Um, for me, I think something that's really important to bring into the conversation of collage as a medium is that um, I'm interested in the way that collage can cooperate with printed matter. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, I'm actually using the knowledge that I have from being a traditionally trained printmaker to look at, examine, select the printed matter that I choose to bring into the collage world that Mm -hmm. I'm building. So I'm looking at how something is printed, if it's lithographic offset press, if it has a like a a nice fuzzy dot or something that's more crisp, like I get into the weeds with it. And and that for me is a way of also letting the collage work not just be about a kind of randomness or a gut feeling. I'm looking for very specific qualities out of the material that I want to work with. Awesome. But is there, like, I'm looking for a title. I don't know if there is one. It doesn't have to be defined as one word, but is it? You know, is it, um, you, would you say you fit in within the modern art world? Is it abstract? Is it, uh, is there something else beyond collage or that's it? 
One of the words that I've been using lately that I think really encapsulates the theme that I'm looking at and kind of the, the raison d'etre with the work that I'm making is the idea of transrealism. So uh, transrealism <laughs> builds on ideas of science fiction. It builds on the understanding of, in many cases, um, it's used in fiction worlds to understand that we're representing something that could be real, that's maybe in the <coughs> near future, that, but that's also perhaps a bit off. Um, and so it's, it's work that embraces an idea of apocalypse, survivalism, um, dystopian futures, really light Sunday morning kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> well, I think that makes a lot of sense, though, when you're describing your work, because yeah. you are, uh, in your work, there's a lot of um, references to the future, to the past. And so, so, so in a way, yeah, that, that makes complete sense yeah. when you take a look at your work. Totally. And uh, before we get you to you to stress, uh, mm -hmm. do you want to um, just uh, maybe throw out your website or Instagram as people are listening, they could check out your work as we're chatting about it. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, Amy, go ahead. Sure. Uh, if you're curious about the website or the work that I'm just talking about, um, please visit me at amybrown.com. C-A, that's A-I-M-E-E-B-R-O-W-N dot C-A. And then on Instagram, um, in my professional life, I usually use my middle name. So I'm Amy Henny Brown, A-I-M-E-E-H-E-N-N-Y-B-R-O-W-N. There, <laughs> there you go. There yeah. You go. Just it yourself. Um, my website is www dot, uh, dot tristesse t-r-i-s-t-e-s-s-e -S -S -E -E s-e-e-l-i-g-e-r dot com damn <laughs> nice nice and uh instagram is at missy trissy which is uh, <laughs> my husband's <laughs> brainchild <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome when i found you great uh, great name so yeah. what, what about yourself do you think you what other um uh, genres do you associate yourself with or you work towards within your art what would you say well you know, if I'm being totally honest, um, I, I don't think I ever have thought of, you know, I didn't, I don't think I approached uh, making art in that way so much. Um, and, you know, now it's important for me to think about placing myself in some kind of context, of course. But I think at the beginning, uh, I started making collages because I was dealing with math, math um, concepts and trying to figure out how to teach math in my uh, art classes with high school students and combining ideas around math and art. And, um, and I was looking a lot at tessellations, which is a, a, a very, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a art kind of math lesson that they do in grade eight a lot. And looking at Islamic tilings and geometry, Escher, um, and and at that time, uh, some friends of mine gave me these maps, and so, and all of a sudden, I was like, oh, I really want to collage, or I want to collage these, cut them up, collage them, and put them into tessellations and tilings. And as soon as I did it, did that, it was magic. So I didn't really, you know, of course, I think a lot of artists can relate to the fact that they come to something not because they had an intellectual idea about it, but that it, there was this instinctual impulse to do it. And, or, you know, they weren't thinking about where they were in the big scheme of things. So I, I just want to keep it real by saying that um, <laughs> I definitely came to doing these collages, which I have been doing for four years now, um, m you know, really organically, and then and then as it's gone and has as it's pro uh, pro progressed, you know, I started meeting more collage artists and kind of really uh, finding my way within that community, and so. Uh, you know, I think Amy's been doing it a bit longer than me, and she's and she's <laughs> definitely had a lot more, I think, time to kind of, um, you know, put herself into that context. But I, yeah, I, I would say that, um, yeah, I, I think I'm still sort of finding my way, and and I also don't necessarily think of myself just as a collage artist because. Yeah. I'm constantly feeling like, oh, you know, like I, you know, where I think I want to go next, n next year, it will be away from that. But um, I definitely am following this theme. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people can relate to that, though. Oh, of course. Yeah. And that's why, uh, uh, that's why I mentioned also painting in the beginning. But it is interesting that uh, you, I don't, do, do you think you have to have a name uh, of the art that you do? And the reason why I even asked that question is because I found that in your bios, you describe your work really well, but you didn't. I guess you could say you didn't corner yourself into just one 
John, like you, uh, Amy mentioned, uh, project-based artists, and I thought it was a really cool way to mention that because it gives you the freedom of being whatever you want to be within the the medium that you're pursuing. Um, but it's yeah, intentional. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think there is there is sort of a uh, what I notice in that writing about art and uh, if you have people who are interested in asking you what you do they're looking for a very succinct quick answer but the truth of it is I think much more vast and broad like Tristes when you're talking about how collages come in and helped inform some of your painting work I really relate to that because it's I think we are all and especially uh, within the women that are showing within the institution exhibition we are multitudes we have a lot of different ways of making yeah. that are maybe more about the ideas that we're pursuing and hunting down than it is about oh I'm a collage artist so I have to make collage totally. I'm interested in ideas and if it needs to be a collage then it's a collage if it needs to be a drawing then that's what I need to be doing and to mm -hmm. to allow yourself the latitude to be able to do that so that you don't get stuck in a bit of a hamster wheel yeah. and as Tristess mentioned it's like you don't start out doing art be like, oh, I'm going to be, I'm just a realist pa uh, painter. Although, actually, I wonder if some people, do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe they do do that. But it's, yeah, uh, the whole idea, it seems like restricting if you just do that to yourself. But it's, you know, yeah, when it comes to galleries and you have a show coming up, it seems like you have to say something about yourself and people want a digestible name, right? So Yeah, and, yeah. and I, and I appreciate that you have to do some thinking about where where you're at like once you've uh explored your themes and developed a body of work then i really appreciate the fact that we need to think about where we are in relationship to the other artists around us and uh what we're commenting on and i think that's just an important intellectual exercise it's difficult to do totally. um yeah. i think when you talk to any artist about them writing their artist statement there's a lot of groans and uh <laughs> and and um yeah just like a bit of discomfort because i think any work that you're doing intellectually and artistically there is some discomfort and with that discomfort comes quality work often so you just got to embrace it and then and then you're starting to i think it's just a in a lot of ways when you do that you're really discovering who you are and what what your voice is and so um i think finding where you are in the context of a much bigger situation is uh, you know art artistic situation whether it is in the community that you're in or in the world you know you're lucky if you're, you're being <laughs> discussed in the in that community <laughs> that yeah. large of a community but it's just like very very important work to do but it's mm -hmm. difficult and uh i i i also find it difficult because um, I, I really have a lot of different ideas. I think that, I, you know, ideas aren't something that I have a problem with, but it's like, I don't want to pigeonhole myself um, mm, yeah. into one. Like I've spent four years collaging and it's, I'm still finding it interesting, but I also think, okay, well, what's the next thing I want to do? And if Amy did a total right turn and wanted to make you know, she, <clears throat> she started wanting to make, um, you know, something that she's never done before, then I think every artist needs to have the freedom to do that. And so, you know, especially if it's following the intellectual track that you're on or creative track that you're on, that's important to do. So, yeah, I think, you know. What if it doesn't? What if you just want to do completely 180? Like, one thing? Yeah, well, no, oh. 180. Like, what if you want to do, it doesn't, it's not even going to follow the uh, intellectual line. What yeah. about that? Are we cool with that? Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've seen a lot of artists who have decided where they're like, okay, I'm a landscape painter. I've been a landscape painter for 20 years. Um, but what I really need to do for this particular project is to embrace an idea of hard metal sculpture. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Just that's completely, uh, yeah. But I think also, like, there's the voice of the artist in that regardless. Yeah. How too. they look at landscape, how they digest the information in the world around them, what kind of research they engage with. And... I'm putting air quotes around research that could be <laughs> sketching, yeah. that could be looking at books, that could be looking at other artists, but that voice is going to translate across medium. And that's, mm -hmm. I hear a lot of people, um, I teach an art and business class. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we do within that class is often learning how to write artist statements without feeling like you're going to pigeonhole yourself <laughs> into something so specific that you'll never be able to make anything else. But to also give yourself the flexibility where if you want to make that hard 180 turn, that you have the breadth and the room for that exploration. Mm -hmm. 
because I think it does get scary when you feel locked into your medium and your ideas are moving beyond that. Yeah, and then uh, we had a chat uh, last week and I thought another thing that we uh, brought up is how um, the audience has come to expect something from you, you know, and it's almost like an extra added uh, uh, pressure maybe to produce um, work that's within the uh, kind of along the path that you've been following before, right? And it probably can play into it as well. Do you feel that or no? I think that I think that's a super uh, interesting question because uh, I think as as you're as you're making work, if you've had any type of success with it, which means that people have responded to it and maybe bought bought it, um, and you get into a gallery system, then then sometimes there is pressure from the gallery or from your clientele that they would like the same thing to be produced. And I think that's you know I've had a I have had some. Uh, success with my map work mm -hmm. um, so I do feel that a tiny bit actually but I also have decided because I don't rely on the income that I'm making from my artwork mm -hmm. um, to, to, to live that um, I think my what I'd like to do with my own uh, creative process is to to actually allow myself the freedom to explore and mm -hmm. so like for me in the next little while I, I'd really like to uh, go into the creative cave and <laughs> which <laughs> was my studio kind of cave, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and play a little bit more and push myself in the direction I'd like to and not necessarily um, make more of the same map work although I, I like it and would if mm -hmm. somebody commissions me to do that I will do it and um, but I also really would like to push my creative like I think that's what I'm planning for my next year is to give myself like four months and sort of do a self-imposed um, art art residency is you know scary? in my studio <laughs> what is it scary um actually to preparing for this show um, I sort of pushed myself away from the maps mm -hmm. a little bit, and but I'm still doing the collage and tessellation. But then it went into painting, and I it was scary when I started doing it because I had to produce for the show, which was great because I had a deadline and I had to get it out, which I think a lot of people uh, feel you know it, it can be really good for you, but it is scary because you're putting your work out into the world and you need it to look you want it to look good and you want to feel proud of it. Um, so it did push me a little bit out of my comfort zone. And then I think it kind of got me tapped into where I want to go. So I think it's all positive, but it wasn't comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how about you? Amy? Oh, I'm, I'm very <laughs> sympathetic. <to that. laughs> I did, the moment where you're forcing your work to grow beyond what you know is exceptionally important as a career artist. That's, I think, part of the reason that we choose what we do. But at the same token, it means you're constantly pushing up against your boundaries and your comfort zone. Yeah. And so there isn't that same kind of stable structure if you are going into work a day in studio in the same way that someone's maybe going into the job that they have in another field where they're like, I know what time I'm going to take my lunch. I know what's going to happen in the course of the day. I know who's going to call. I know who's going to email. There's a lot of <laughs> unexpected yeah. work in there. But that's also what I find keeps me on my toes. It keeps me going to studio. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting. You're already giving out so much advice, but kind of it, it al almost goes along the lines of embrace the struggle, whether it's <laughs> writing that uh, uh, little paragraph about yourself or I can I completely relate to that. Uh, last night I was staying up late and trying to name my pieces and even that, yeah. you know, putting putting emotions into words. Yeah. I mean, I know it's, it's a step away from uh, writing a piece about yourself, but still it's, yeah, it's like when you're trying to, put words to a visual medium and you got to try to like dig through the vocabulary in your head trying to get it as close as you can because me, it, most likely it's not going to be that close anyways right well and you're essentializing something and yeah. i think that's also yeah. why there's so much resistance you know, when we're talking about artist statements you're distilling work and thought and energy and the kind of ideas that you're pursuing into very fixed words that have very fixed meanings. Mm -hmm. And that's also, I think, why a lot of people struggle with titles, too. Yeah, yeah. Although I rage against untitled. Me too, me yeah. too. Or, <laughs> honestly, I still... I'm I didn't know that about you, Amy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> We're learning so much. I also, I think, kind of like you, I'm... When people name study one, I think I want it to be a little bit more than just study one. I get it, and, and <laughs> we've all done it, I guess, but give me a name. How are you feeling? I was frustrated when I was painting this. That's a good title. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. You know, 
It's good to hear that, that, you, that there's some opinion about that because I actually do, my titles are, are sort of boring. So am I, are you letting me know I don't me think that? that at all. <laughs> no, I think, I, I honestly. I think they're awesome actually. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, really? Not to, oh, not to like blatantly disagree with you, but yeah. I think your title game is strong. Oh, okay. Yeah. Flags for New Countries for me is I think one of the most exciting titles that I have seen with, is it okay to quantify or qualify as like geometric abstraction. Yep, of course, yeah. Um, for me, that gave me a place to go in my mind where I could think about what kind of content I would bring into the work. And Well, yeah. I just have to just say, <laughs> because go. my husband's <laughs> listening right now, that it was his title. Uh, you know, job. my husband, David Crompton, photographer, um, amazing human, he uh, is like my number one go-to person when I when I am working on something. He's the one, he's you know um, as well as you, Amy, and uh, a few other people in my life. Um, he gives me a lot of feedback. And when I was doing those, um, when when I was making those flags for new countries, of starting to make them, uh, we were looking at Agnes Martin's work in, mm -hmm. in bed one night. <laughs> as we do and um <laughs> and he was like oh these are like flags for new countries and i was like oh that's the title of my next and you really that's don't. a gem that's awesome. i know it was yeah. such a gem and, and actually he <laughs> is so good at that he's he's so good at that his brain works like that and he's he, the title whisperer he, he is the title whisperer <laughs> and he's not just like like that for me he's been mm. like that for a lot of people like mm. we have friends who are musicians and over my life with him which it's been like 19 years now nice. um he he has often done that and and i i think it's so essential to have people around you that are giving you know the way that he works functions for me and some of my little art tribe like amy and vanessa and you know just a, a bunch of people that i talk to you know those people when you can't see outside of what you're locked into at the moment mm -hmm. give you a little uh, a word or a push and yeah. and then and then you and then you find your way so that flags for new countries was definitely david crompton and nice. uh Very nice. and collaboration. but i had the in, i had the intelligence to notice that that was a great that's right that's what i'm saying so you, you took the second the, the second step that was needed to be there you should just like record him all the time just i know recorder well, i basically do do that okay yeah if you, if you have a good memory yeah. i like it when uh, names for pieces also don't tell you what it is but tell you what can be added extra yeah like when you see a flower vase and it says it's a flower vase i guess i get it maybe it's a study but if you're trying to mm -hmm. bring something extra extra like in this case where like the name all of a sudden brings an extra na narrative piece that you totally. may not have yeah. known about it mm -hmm. I guess yeah that's yeah. nice uh, yeah otherwise like, well, do you think i cannot tell that it's a green vase <laughs> <laughs> i can tell yeah. no i think that's a it's important for the work to operate as a platform mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh so because i have you two here i'm gonna ask this question uh what do you think uh makes great collage work mm. <laughs> Thank you for the generous hand. <laughs> you didn't see Adventure <laughs> Stas was passing along the <laughs> honors to Amy. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of different ways to approach collage. I'm interested as much with people who are trying to make seamless joins and really excellent pairings that are kind of surprising in that the fact that they are disparate parts, as I am with folks who are looking to really push stuff up against one another that's jarring and abrasive. I look at a lot of collage work. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I think there's a moment where the pieces have to transcend their original intention. Mm -hmm. So whether that's because the joinery is seamless or there's a new world that's created or you get to notice something that you couldn't see before through repetition, scale comes into play. Like I think there's a lot of fundamentals that can make really great tight collage work. But for me, it's definitely a moment where I get to kind of have a gasp or a, a kind of light bulb where I'm looking at the work and it's it opens up something new, like mm -hmm. there's there's new potential in it. So it's the sum is creating something greater than the individual parts. I love that you got to say that again. The the original work has to transcend its original. Sorry, I, I, I'm already messing it up, but it was really well said. 
I like uh, how- yeah, no, it, it, just that idea of like when you, I think the idea of collage is that you have things that you're bringing into a work that have had a previous life. And now they have a new purpose, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's awesome. Yeah, so their combination creates something new and exciting and it gives you a different lens to look at the world through. That's, I, that's for me the kind of the moment where I'm really excited about collage work. That's a good marker. Because, uh, yeah, I guess if you take someone else's photo and you put a, like, a little thing in it, I mean, you, you're not really changing it that much, I guess, right? Yeah, I want to see the that context count? shift. Mm. Oh, it all counts. I, I mean, I'm not... That's art. Yeah. <laughs> no, we are here to tell everyone. <laughs> I am uncomfortable with that job. I know, me too. Yeah. <laughs> so my answer to that yeah. uh, is... Did you, did either of you go to see Mashup at the Vague? Mm-hmm. So yes, it was really yeah. cool for me to go see that show because there was a lot of collage-like work in that show uh, because in a way the whole show is about that. Uh, and I loved going upstairs to the very top where they had all the you know original collage artists and Ka- yeah. Hannah Hawk. Ka- do we remember who it was? Picasso. Uh, yeah, there was some Picasso work, Hannah Hawk. They had some super studio book works up there that were really nice, like yeah. early collage. So it was really cool for me to see the some of those collages because they're older and how they've held up over time. And also just what those people were doing and how weird it must have seemed at the time mm, for uh, a yeah. general arts community to take a look at that work. And then and then there at the beginning of the show, when you walked in, there was, um, and I'm so sorry, I don't remember the artist, but there was a cat. Somebody had taken a videos of cat, cat videos of cats playing the piano and they collaged it, you know, collaged it yeah. in air quotes um, together to play this very obscure piece of music that is written <laughs> uh, and I forget what it's called but I loved that um, so in a lot of ways collage is an, uh, an intellectual idea where uh, you know when you look at the amount of collage work that's done especially if you if you would uh, include video and music in a way like sampling because mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of interesting ideas when you connect all those things together you, you really can see that um, it is a profound uh, medium right now that people are collecting. We, we, we have so many images around us all the time. We have a lot of sound around us all the time. Um, uh, you know, we are being subjected to a lot of, you know, media and ideas. And so it, I think it, 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 you, when you put it through the filter of a human person and they're, and they're, and they're like, c- combining it for you to try to make a new sense of all this stuff. I think there's something, you know, it's like a filter in a way. Collage is kind of like a filter mm. to kind of make sense of the world around you. And there is a lot of exciting collage happening. And, um, but yeah, it was, it was, for me, it was pretty profound to go back and look at early works because I was, I was like, wow, they, they had to be gutsy to do that. Cause yeah. it kind of looks like the, you know, in a lot of ways, if you look at it, like somebody who doesn't know anything about art and doesn't look at collage, they could be like, oh, that's insane. Like, why do they do that to that <laughs> face? You know, yeah. um, they're being crazy and w- that's making that ugly. But in a lot of ways, it was just like, you know, having somebody go, wow, this is really cool. You're deconstructing the way that women are constantly being shown in the media. And that, you know, that's turned, yeah, of course, that's turned out to be like a very important move. That would have right? been so interesting to be, to be, to experience that without ever having seen collage you know what i mean to go to the first collage yeah, show yeah, ever like, or found art mix art whatever that would have been yes. and uh, so w- what you just said it's interesting that both of you do go i think uh, on one of your bios it said like analog the fact that it's you know oh there because you're just talking about these days the amount of data you can find and yeah. photos and imagery it's it can be overwhelming but you could as long as you kind of know your path you can take it really well but it's cool that it's not just a collage in Photoshop and you put it all together. I think it's great that uh, I'm biased, but I think it's great <laughs> that it is like physical medium when you're cutting things. And uh, mm-hmm. that's very appealing to me. Yeah, I think for a lot of the work for both Tristess and I, I think we use digital tools mm-hmm. when it's necessary. Oh, but yeah. mm-hmm. there's also, I think, something really delicious about just sitting down at a table with a great blade and cutting stuff out. Yeah, like, a- Amy. Amy's got like about 200 <laughs> pairs of scissors. It's All true. different shapes yeah. and sizes. Yeah, no, it's and true. she's like, I remember somebody asking her, like, 
do you have some scissors? And she was all like, why, yes. <laughs> and she pulls out like this box you of scissors. You open up your coat. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, like. <laughs> it, was, it was so awesome, though. It's like, that's for real. Amy's for real. She's the real deal. Uh. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. I love it. Um, and uh, so along those lines, how would you say you get better in collage work specifically? And this is, you know, these are questions coming from uh, a guy who just like, I try to find some reference to sit down and paint where I feel like with collage work um, uh, once you get all the scissors and really good like hands at cutting out shapes it seems like the uh, or from my perspective and let me know if I'm wrong but uh, it's this uh, the conceptual and the idea and uh, uh, curating what you're going to use and then in, in the end what you're saying also how you appropriate it to be this new thing that it wasn't before and you, it takes a really good eye um, so I mean that's my idea, but how would you say how, how do you get better within the collage medium, as far as technical skill? Do you want me to take it? No, sure. Okay, <laughs> Amy's looking at me like, um, what do you think? Your turn. Um, Educate us. Well, okay. So I, as a teacher, uh, I I'm constantly asking my students to do new things. So I'll ask them to take a collage and I'll set up pr pr uh, criteria parameters that they have to work within, and. Um, you, it can be very simple or it can be a little bit more complex uh, with, you know, a more complex idea. Um, and then, you know, kids set up to do that. So I don't, I really don't think that there's one way to make a good collage mm -hmm. or, um, you know, in a lot of ways, like this, this is something as a teacher that I see all the time is that you can set up, I, I kind of find that it's good to set up really strict criteria give pr fairly limited pr um, parameters because then and y if you give out that kind of criteria to like say 30 people you'll get back 30 totally different yeah. uh, responses so you realize that the criteria is really helping them come up with a lot of ideas if you if you say to somebody um, like the, your question is how to do good collage or no, how, how do you how you how do you get better within collage work Right. Well, just I think that's like just do the work. I mean, the composition is a huge thing. It's <laughs> yeah. the design, right? It's just, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah like in it's your just opinion, straight yeah, up yeah. do the work, I yeah. would yeah. say. Yeah. Like, there's no long, sorry, I was trying to make a long answer out of it. No, a but it was answer. a really good example, yeah. though. It's so true. And uh, the, the whole thing about restrictions, it, it, you want to get people to be creative. When you have too many choices, it's really hard to. Yeah, there's re restrictions usually do make better work. I would yeah, say. as a teacher and an artist, I have felt like the be the 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 more criteria I give myself and I give my students, the better the work is because there's because I do believe that when we're given absolute choice, it's very difficult to know where to start. Mm -hmm. So there's this one I was looking at a, a collage assignment that's basically like take five pieces of paper or five lines cut five lines out of uh, black and white paper and then make interesting compositions with it and and um you know you make 20 or you know and and so you'll get the most interesting work like you'll it's so simple but it's a very beautiful uh exercise because then in a lot of ways if people take it seriously if, people, if the students get into it or you get into it then you you're dealing with a very stripped down situation and you're coming up with a lot of different mm -hmm. looks and and compositions and mm -hmm. then that kind of just tells you that it's never done mm -hmm. like the other thing i would say about getting better is that you, when in order to get better you have to recognize that you're going to make a mistake or it's not going to look good and and just suck it up like <laughs> deal with it the fact that you're, right. you're take your ego out of it and go okay well that didn't work what didn't work about it and if you're a scientist about it in a way, like, okay, this didn't work, so what's the next step? Then you're gonna get better. Mm -hmm. Like, really, mm -hmm. it's just, I think that's simple. I've become really interested too in like figuring out how to absorb failure faster and better. Yeah. And that oftentimes the intention that you go in with is very important, like you're talking about setting up parameters so that you can make choices and move the work forward. And alongside that, I think it is important to remind ourselves that looking is work, mm -hmm. that like giving yourself time in the mode of production or in the mode of making to take a step back and to look at your material, how is it relating to one another and to try and, and train a bit of a neutral eye 
as well because we can get so close to the work that it's really hard to make yeah, decisions really. about it and that's why having studio mates for me is actually really so essential important. yeah but the other side of that too i think is to also <laughs> allow yourself the opportunity if you are moving in a direction it is also important to see what's happening on the peripheral mm -hmm. like one of the things that i've been really excited about in making my intentional work is that I'm documenting the backside of the collages as well. Mm. And often those compositions are a little more fresh. <laughs> they're a little more <laughs> unusual. And they're not always like what I would consider to be successful collages towards the intention that I'm pursuing. But, but they're rad, Amy. Oh, there's something they're in them. Yeah, they're cool. The but accidental is beautiful, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's just like every once in a while you'll just be like, well, that was definitely better than what I was Flip going for. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there's something in that, that like the, the work of an artist or the work of, of a professional visual creator is not just about like hunting after the intended goal, but giving yourself space and time to look at what happens on the peripheral as well. Mm -hmm. Like there's intention, but there's also just giving yourself permission to notice what's going on. And it's really great that you can find a way to still channel spontaneity within the, uh, the mixed, uh, what would you say? I mean, like the collage work, because they're, yeah, I mean, whether you see the back or you have something that like one thing just fell on top of one another, the other, and just like just clicks. Totally. Because I think there's mediums where it's a lot harder to be very accidental. You know, whether you're, I would say, like if you're filming or a sculptor, you know, imagine you like I don't know, you're going to cast something out of bronze. It's although I mean, there's probably ways to just like, uh, but it's it seems to me that it's very important to find those accidents because they're just going to teach you so much more. Yeah, part yeah. of that I think is digging in deep on process. Like mm. giving yourself the opportunity rather than just saying, I want to make a painting that looks like this, or I want to document this kind of space through my drawing, or I want my collage work to have this kind of resonance, is to also just get really super in the weeds with the process mm -hmm. so that you're noticing what your material is doing. You're noticing how it conveys meaning. And that I think that's where also you can look at a, at a work and see that there's layers there in terms of concept, mm -hmm. delivery of, of idea, rather than something that's just surface level that's about solely pursuing the end goal. Mm -hmm. um, product is important, but process is really, really oh good. Yeah. And this is where work really is. And, and like a, it's probably a, a mis you know, the whole misconception about art being easy, you know, it still exists, unfortunately. But as far as work goes, like finding a process and really I mean you're like you're saying yeah. you're gonna make so many mistakes and you're just gonna have to try to figure out but that research and you know whether you then you know trying to dig into art history and trying to find extra elements that can be brought in has it been done before and actually that this takes me uh, uh, this is a good segue into the next question is um, as you're creating your work now and as you're creating this work for uh, the show is gonna be in June 2nd uh, have you <coughs> do you consciously think about of how you can bring something new whether it's into the medium or your work, is that on your mind? I I can answer for myself and and that I sort of I think always. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't want to be making work that I know over and over again, because um, I think I sort of like you develop a really great toolkit of things that you can do well. Um, and that you know how they'll cooperate or how elements will work together. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the things that keeps me coming back to studio is to be thinking of like, how do you push this? How do you shift the material? How do you bring a new vocabulary into the work that you're making? Even just how you display work, like that's, it's that t tiny 10% at the end that I think either makes <laughs> or breaks work. Sorry, I think there's a baby somewhere around <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you're not, if you don't, if you, we are in on Hastings Street, uh, the front go. of uh, Save on Meats, and there's a, um, so that's the noise. Come hang with us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You can stand in front of the window and wave at us. It's yeah. also great. Yeah, we appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> but it was a total interru interruption for Amy, though. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. No, but it, the life happens. Even for, like you're saying, for framing, uh, uh, yeah, the amount of ways you can find to do, uh, like, create something new is really great yeah yeah well and I think that's something for me um <coughs> intentionally bringing in Julia and Jesse into the conversation that we're having because of having four different artists showing in one space 
and having different tactics about how we show and share our work, I think makes for a really rich opportunity. Like I'm always idea hunting when I mm -hmm. go to galleries. I'm looking at the work as much as I am thinking about like, oh, I really like that display mechanism or that hardware looks <laughs> great. Yeah. And it's I'm, I'm very comfortable nerding out about that because it's strategies. Yep. And to be able to see how Jesse is working in a in almost a figurative way with collage and is creating dimensional figures out of her work for me is really inspiring to think about building depth into my collage work which is usually pretty flat and 2D mm -hmm. and so th I find that there's been some really nice ways of just like within this small community of four artists of building a bit of a vocabulary and an understanding that th what you can do within that framework of, of 2D based work or collage work is actually quite vast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, Jessie's been doing this, She's what she's gonna be presenting in, in situ is, I forget what it's called, what's, what's her piece, is, what's it called? That's a great oh, question. Okay, sorry. Sorry, Jess. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> it'll come to me actually in a minute. Um, but her work is um, these beautiful painterly like, um, depictions of people mm -hmm. uh, that are separated out of context but they're contemporary people you can see that it's uh, people that have that exist now at, at this time in history and um, but they're they're very painterly and um, and and small and uh, sort of I, I would say that they're precious I don't know if she would describe it like that and then um, and then Julia's work, Julia Kruitz's work is, uh, has lately been taking a, a bunch of images that are more about the human experience and being in, and the spirit of humanity, um, looking at patterns and tapestries and uh, vessels and how we, how we contain our spirit. And so she has, she's sort of dealing with um, kind of a bigger concept and and all, but making it sort of more minimal in her compositions and mm -hmm. they're you know they're quite they're it's quite different from my work um i think i think what's cool about this and and you know we amy and i had talked about this like a year ago that and and actually julia and jesse we we wanted to work together because we've been drawn together by you know shows or meeting up and recognizing that we're you know following this track that we're on and that bringing us all together would be something that we all you know we're looking forward to and wanted to do and so this is this this show um feels like a long time coming and i'm super excited about it because there there are these three women that i'm showing with i'm so excited to be showing with because i completely respect them as artists and people and I believe in their work and uh, it's all, I feel like it's all quite different. So it sort of gives a nice little snapshot of what's happening, you mm -hmm. know. That is yeah. really cool. And that's actually, that's what struck me at first when I went onto uh, the South Main Gallery page to see the art show is that not only it's very diverse, mm -hmm. as you were mentioning, even though w w within the same uh, genre, you could say, but like everyone's approach to it is so fascinating. And yeah, I mean, from you're saying how in Jesse's work, uh, being figurative yet still having the cu cutout element and the way she approaches each shape is really it's cool. It's delightful. Yeah, and I really like how, uh, like you were mentioning about uh, Julia's work, is that the really clean spaces, like the backgrounds, yeah. and then I, I think it fits within the, uh, I guess, whether it's uh, you're saying human emotions or interactions, how they play into within those compositions and then within the organic shape. It's just like really, uh, yeah. They're I, stunning. I was really fascinated by mm. everyone's work. And actually, so let's... Uh, I might as well just get into it then. Yeah, uh, let's talk about South Main Gallery <laughs> and the show. Let's do, yeah, let's talk about the show. Um, so do you want to give a little, uh, or a little uh, long story about how uh, this came to be, how these four artists that, how, well, actually, well, yeah, how do you find each other and how did this show come together? Well, <laughs> I met, uh, well, Julia actually uh, runs the GAM Gallery, which is on, it's like this beautiful little gallery where there are amazing shows that continue to, um, so she's the co-founder with Tara Hogue mm -hmm. uh, and sh she curates there and owns the gallery and then she's an artist and has artist spaces there and I and I actually she a asked me to have a show there and while I you know while I kind of came into that space which was I was invited to come into the space to have the show you know I was introduced to Ju um, 
Jesse because Jesse had some work there. And then Amy, how did we meet? I think we've we had circled around one another yeah. socially, but I think the honestly the first time we met one another was when we found out we were studio mates. Yeah, at we, the Arts Factory. Because mm-hmm. I was gonna say you are studio mates. Yeah. yeah. So you've been there for a while before even meeting each other. Well, we both we actually got the space at the same uh, like we moved in on the same day. Nice. Which it was so it was like yes because I <laughs> because I I had very small interactions with Amy. And they all were just amazing. She's smart. She's kind. She's talented. So you know, like great. Uh, that's both of you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Nice. No, no, but it's true. And and um and then Julia had invited me to come and have a show there. But and you know, it's kind of it's one of those indie galleries on Hastings Street. You know, that's mm-hmm. it's a bit more challenging, and not as many people know about it. But they're they're what's amazing about the Gam Gallery is they're constantly bringing in and giving uh, emerging artists great opportunities to show their work. And it's become known as kind of a hub of like, you know, this is the next up and coming thing. Awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so at that time, you know, I, I think that as an artist, you have to create opportunities for yourself. And Amy's an amazing writer. So when we, this last past year, we were sort of talking like, how, how can we, we l- let's put together a proposal for a show. And we did without really having like a specific spot to, to place the show mm-hmm. we wrote up this proposal of bringing these artists together because it's like uh, you know wanting to work with people you respect mm-hmm. and then yes. and then and then making it happen choosing them asking them to be a part of it curating your own show which is Tristess' superpower making nice. things happen <laughs> seriously no and that's I think we've collaborated in a couple of events yeah. now or like whether that's proposals or actual events that are taking place in the city and what I really appreciate is like everybody brings a, a skill set with them but mm-hmm. it is particularly magical when you meet someone who is like I will light that fire <laughs> it, and it's just really it's remarkable to have Aww. that it's a gift it you, really gotta, is. you gotta have those people uh, before we uh, I really want to get uh, one thing I was curious uh, about and really want to find out is how the theme came to be and how because yeah, four artists, one theme. That's you got to make sure and that it totally works. And totally different, yeah. like in a lot of ways, yeah. Exactly. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, actually, yeah, let's let's talk about that. How how did you make that work? That's a challenging task. I think it's th- the nice thing about the way that the writing built around this show is that we know the work really intimately. Um, we've had the opportunity to meet the artists and get to know them and get to know why they make the work that they do were colleagues and friends. Um, And I think thematically, instead of looking at picking a theme and trying to shoehorn the work into it, the theme came about a bit more organically by saying, okay, we have a group of people that we really want to work with, that we're excited to build as colleagues and to create opportunities for ourselves, and to look at ways that we could frame our practice that was broad enough that everybody's work could shift or change within that, but also so specific enough so that you can say, this is what the show m- means mm-hmm. when you yep. put it forward for a proposal. Because I think the writing for a proposal situation does have to have a, a clearer agenda yeah um and this is once again putting words on paper about yeah. now four artists so that's it <laughs> yeah and a, and so, like so we met briefly i wrote down i basically looked at everybody's work and i wrote down my you know just like thoughts and feelings about it in point form and then i and then i came to amy and said these are the things that i'm seeing and then Amy took that all the way <laughs> into her special sp- head space. And it's then, weird up there. Yeah. yeah. And she, um, you know, we, she was like, okay, I feel like this is, we're all sort of dealing with how we situate ourselves in space and place. And, um, and, then, and then she turned it into this really great proposal that, that I think pretty much nailed it well and we also what I really appreciated in that process is being able to have back and forth about it too yeah. so we'd hammer out a couple of paragraphs and toss it back and forth and have a bit of a chat and that's a luxury to me often uh, I think when you're writing particularly writing for the arts it can be a bit of like a lonely activity yeah. <laughs> and to have a group of people that were collectively interested and invested in the success of that writing to know that it's a bit, it's a calling card for the show Mm -hmm. um, and that this would be how we were presenting ourselves. It it really, for me to be able to have an editing process where we were all really participatory was exceptional. 
Mm-hmm. Very cool. And so then I didn't know this was a proposal. Uh, and so how did the South Main Gallery come into the picture then? Well, I just uh, recently had started a relationship with the South Main Gallery, which is a wonderful gallery that's on 6th and Main. Mm-hmm. And really cool space. Yeah, it's a yeah. beautiful, yeah. beautiful space. Um, they actually, you know, to, to their credit, they actually assessed uh, out a lot of people last year because they wanted to do this uh, show called The Summer 7, where they were bringing in new artists into their space to kind of energize the space and bring in, you know, people that are a little maybe outside what they've been doing. And so they're they're really interested in Don and Louisa, who uh, Don is the owner and Louisa is the, the uh, she assists curating. And they are really interested in bringing new energy into that space. So they went on, uh, they sussed me out and they came in, had a studio visit and they decided to put my husband and I into a show last year. And yeah, so um, yeah, it was really cool. And then uh, they have been very open to talking with their artists and developing strategies to bring people into their, the gallery to, uh, to, you know, bring in work that is exciting and interesting and local. Uh, but they are, they also have, uh, people coming from like Portland and California and things like that. So they've been very, it's been an amazing gallery experience. It's not what I've heard, you know, necessarily is the norm. So they're, they've been so interested in, or I think really they recognize that they're dealing with people who are engaged and, you know, in, in intelligent in the scene. Uh, <laughs> and so they are drawing upon those talents, which is, I think, what we should be doing to help, ev- you know, if everyone's working together, we're going to be so much more powerful and strong mm-hmm, and, totally. and, and developing the arts than if you uh you know it gets weird or competitive or whatever right so um yeah. i i really appreciate that about the uh, south main gallery um and right now they're doing they actually have a call out for the summer seven last day today I is think. it the last yeah, day okay so today. so that's that that's Get something for your artists out there <laughs> listening today that um they are accepting proposals for the <clears throat> summer seven show again um they have been really interested in showing new work uh un- unusual work mm-hmm. merging artists and that's super cool and i love that they're doing an open call like yeah. I, that's yeah, really me too. Yeah. absolutely it takes more work absolutely mm-hmm. to call Over all of it. that ac- yeah. activity and to have a look at the applications but i think it also embraces a spirit of being welcome and open for surprises or people who are maybe underrepresented yeah. in the community. And I think that's a really bold move. It's really important. And for the gallery with their catalog, I mean, you can see the kind of artists they present, which so that when I found out about the call as well, I thought it was really cool that, you know, there is these ways to get into uh, like uh, larger gallery spaces. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, because that process can be incredibly intimidating. Oh, yeah. And often actually so often speaking with a lot of artists you know how, when you ask them like how do you get into this gallery like <coughs> you know 95 percent of people say i don't know i just it's happened just met someone you know yeah. usually it's, it seems very at least uh it, from my perspective where people i've spoken to it seems very challenging to get into especially a prestigious gallery which you know makes sense it's logical there in the end they'll still have to be a business and they have to there is their selection process and the ways they have to find people but but which is why this is once again really amazing that south main is um yeah doing an open call it's really cool There's it is really yeah. cool yeah mm-hmm. i i i uh i feel like it's a smart move on their part actually i, mm-hmm. I don't think it's just cool of them i think <laughs> it's actually a really yes. smart move <laughs> nice. because because um main street is you know it's uh, an area in the city that has a lot of creative interesting people um smart people you know like no, every, every place <laughs> does but but they're you know the, the kind of clientele that's around there needs to have st- stimulation they don't not not going to want to see the same things over and over again okay. like i think K- kafka coffee house has yeah. done that in a lot really amazing because it's like mm-hmm. um you know they show they've been very uh supportive of the arts and and they've shown a lot of emerging artists very and, true yeah and yeah. i like that they stepped in because uh hot art what city unfortunately closed yeah and i mean i love that space so it's definitely a staple i mean the, yeah. the community that i i'm in i always see a lot of, or saw a lot of artists being represented there and so which is so yeah it's great that kafka did s- kind of have a space close by they can still 
serve those means because it's been actually pretty hard finding uh, totally. art spaces for artists and yeah. especially yes. in Vancouver yeah I think it is a, a particular issue in Vancouver and that's why like having an open call or curating alternative spaces becomes very important oh yeah and I, I, I expect to see a lot more of that uh, pop-ups and yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah I guess Artist ev- driven ev- events along those lines. But uh, so you got to let me know. Though. So the proposal, <laughs> did you come to them? Because uh, the reason I, I'm asking mm-hmm. is th- this is a hopefully would be a lesson for a lot of people yeah. that you finding alternative ways into getting into galleries. So you I mean, you've had a relationship with them, but you still have to bring a proposal to the gallery to try to get in. Well, so they did find me. Uh, they they were, you know, I was lucky enough that they came to find me um for the first show last year but then they've been totally open and and yes i was like are you interested in hearing some proposals because mm-hmm. you know of course that's one thing that i do do i do create opportunities for myself um and the people around me that i um that i really believe in so although like i wouldn't have been able to do this proposal without all the other three artists um you know amy amy is an exceptional writer and i'm not um, so, so, so she put together this, like we, we talked about the ideas, but she did make this, she wrote it out really, really well. And so, but you know, that's the thing is you have to find your tribe. Yeah. You have to put it together and then, and actually in a lot of ways you, you drop, like you drop off this product that's already <laughs> totally put together for somebody. I mean, in a lot, you know, if they're looking for something new, then it's like a huge gift to them because oh, yeah. they've got it all set up. And, yeah. and that's what happened, right? So um, they are kind and wise enough to, to accept that and we, and we like hustle to do it. And that's like, you know, just, you just, just do the work, get it done. Very yeah. cool. And then yeah. so along those lines, because you have been showing uh, work, uh, I would say you're very quite experienced. So along those lines, do, would you have any other advice for people to try to, you know whether to get into a gallery or try to show their work is there anything else that um, mm. comes to mind you have to have great documentation oh and that's tough Ugh, yeah. yeah and i don't I d- like that part but <laughs> I, I know it's important no one does yeah. Yeah. um i mean in, unless they do and that's special yeah oh yeah <laughs> um i just think you have to have great documentation of your work it has to be color accurate those are the big like mm-hmm. the super basics i think you do if you're not excited about writing because that's also I have yet to see proposals that don't include some ask of writing or artist course, statement. Yeah. And so I, I really believe in workshopping writing. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to know how your writing reads to someone else. Uh, yeah. um, so getting together with a group of artists, there, maybe there's four or five people, you share each other's artist statements, you talk about what's working and what isn't. And I think that act of workshopping makes it less threatening, but it also gives you a view on how your writing is being read by other people outside your own brain. Yeah. Um, Cause sentences that might make perfect sense to me in my mind <laughs> when read out loud or read by somebody else is just like, Oh, th- that is that's not weird. my, in- yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's weird. That's not my intention. <laughs> and so I really believe in, in finding a group of people that you really trust and build a workshop. Um, where you can get together once a month, once every couple of months and workshop writing for applications and proposals and just get used to doing it. Like picking up on what you're saying, Trista, with the idea of doing the work, like it's practice. It is practice like the rest of your art practices. (laughs) Just when you thought you got into art because you're going to paint a lot, huh? Oh, I know. make a lot of art. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we'll start writing. (laughs) I, I honestly, and I can genuinely say that I think it's one of the toughest things to train yourself to do. But the difference between honing your writing and developing it as part of a craft is really can often be a difference maker for people when you're applying for grants or applying for proposals. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it also shows that you've thought, and you mentioned this too, Teresa, that you've, you're thinking actively about your work. Mm-hmm. If you can contextualize it within contemporary art world through the language that you choose, the examples that you bring forward, the theory you're backing it up with, it doesn't mean that your work is conceptual or is theoretical, but you're bringing those ideas and building layers of meaning with your mm-hmm. work. One of my good friends who's uh, an incredible inspiration to me, Natalie Sinclair, she's a mathematician. She said to me about writing, well, actually, I was like, well, I just want to make things that are beautiful <laughs> and she like every artist yeah. yeah well i don't i actually don't think like every artist really? wants to okay. do that yeah i mean i think a lot of a uh, lot of people that i have come up with uh you know that i went to school with are really interesting in conceptual art and mm, it's not necessarily okay, yeah. about beauty 
Um, <clears throat> so at the time I said that, she was like, well, that is, an a that is an intellectual idea. You can turn that into, you know, you know, of course, there's a lot of r writing about beauty. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like one of human, you know, it's one of our our biggest, uh, ch you know, it's something that we 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 have always searched for in yeah, our most lives. Most perceived subject, yeah. Right? Yeah, it's a it's a, a subject that. So you know, of course, yes, you can find a lot of writing about beauty. So for me, I was like, okay. So she was just basically forcing me to like go <laughs> do the work, right? Because yeah, yeah. in a lot of a lot of times when I come up against things that I'm frustrated with, it's because I'm going to have to like uh, do the work, not avoid it. Um, deal with myself, deal with my own like weaknesses mm -hmm. <laughs> and, that's, and that's hard. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's a good example of how um, you, th there, there's a way to make any theme or any concept work is just a matter of, I guess, like really digging into it. Like you're saying, if you just yeah. want to make beautiful work, but there is a way to uh, approach it, I don't know, like from a conceptual perspective or, you know, try to uh, create like a mature aesthetic around and or, you know, planted into art history Want and find to be ways curious about it too yeah, like yeah. what kind of beauty what does yeah, that look yeah, like yeah. culturally how does that yeah speak? exactly i i think there's the the gift of that moment when you're like okay i've got to do the work on this is also to get really excited about being curious mm -hmm. yes but i say that because <laughs> some people sometimes uh, often they challenge us like where do you start what do you do what do i like to paint or what do i like to create and they can be answer like pretty simple answers to just the things you enjoy, and then it's just a matter of framing it. I never uh, because I went to school for animation, I never got any writing classes, so I'm trying to catch up. But to me, that's a it's a uh, something that I've been learning is that you can really work with any concept as for you, you do your research and then you mm -hmm. try to figure out. I also think that you can't be well. I mean. I don't think you can be great at everything. So, <clears throat> you know, yeah. you have to get, cut yourself some slack. So that's what's great about setting up a tribe of people around you is that you do draw on other people's strengths. And Absolutely. I think there's been a movement lately that has been very uh, community centered where the arts community in Vancouver, especially because that's the, really the only one that I know intimately is that there's a lot more support of each other that when you, when you see something that's be, that, that somebody else is making that's great and you wanna learn from them, you wanna support them, instead of feeling that, you know, jealousy or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, like, and, and when, you, when you start with that and you learn from people around you, then you're gonna move forward a lot faster. And mm -hmm. in a lot of ways it is taking your ego out of it, mm -hmm. like, yeah. uh, which is like, okay, this is about the learning, this is about being curious, um, it's about working hard yeah, and staying on your track, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think part of it too, and, and Tristas, you and I've talked about this, is the idea of, um, I think there's a myth around the idea of scarcity of opportunities, that there's only like a number of opportunities, there's few, you have to compete with everyone or else you won't succeed. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also a way to just address that by saying, I don't actually buy into the idea of scarcity of opportunity. <laughs> mm -hmm. Part of that's about being open-minded about creating chances and ways and methods of showing work and sharing work. But I just don't buy that anymore. Um, I think it was something that was really intact when I was first in school doing my undergrad and that it would be like, oh, there's only so many grants for people and there's only so many ways you can share and show your work. But we have totally blown that wide open. I love that you say that. That's very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, like Amy, um, when you say that though, uh, like what, in what in your experience how have you um done that how have you done that so I, uh, for me one thing that comes to mind immediately i've had the opportunity to do quite a few artist residencies but there have also been opportunities where i wanted to do things where there was no structure mm -hmm. and so i've approached people um, not dissimilar to how you brought our proposal to South Maine. Yeah. And I've said, I re I'm really interested in your training program. I want to build an artist residency with you. Mm -hmm. This is what the program would look like. Are you in? Yeah. And you have the opportunity at that moment. There's no love lost in that. Like if someone says no, you're like, great. Same place that I was two days ago. <laughs> 
Um, but some really interesting things have come out of that. I would I was able to work with a group um, in the east coast of Canada that does survival training, um, and they oh, yeah. they don't <laughs> normally. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That's a good. It's project. so cool. Yeah. Uh, so they they brought me through the same kind of training that they do with coast guards, Navy SEALs. It's very mm. extreme, oh. super physical, <laughs> open ocean training. But they had never worked with an artist before, and so we both got to win out of that. Wow. Yeah, it was a really, and so I think that there are moments like that where if a person were content with the structure that exists, they'd say, oh, well, they don't accept artists. That's not an opportunity for me. But I also s really believe in trailblazing. You're just a go-getter. <laughs> that's well, what people got to learn. I think that that's true, though. I think <laughs> you, that there's must, a yeah. lot of, yeah, I think yeah. especially if you're, you don't have gallery representation and you haven't had a show, then you're going to have to... Um, brainstorm like you can there's spaces that you can rent and you can have a show with other people um, yeah. then it's about publicity and letting people know that it's happening and I don't think talking about your work and being supportive of yourself is a it's, you have to be, do that it's not being egotistical it's just it's just important this is what yeah. I'm doing and I think you have a right to play your cards that you're here for a short time, <laughs> you know, you gotta, you gotta, if you're really interested in doing this, you gotta throw yourself out there. It's like scary as, you know, it's scary. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. really, <laughs> oh, it is scary. For sure. yeah. But it's also just like, yeah, I think that if there's a message about doing that and getting involved and, and having a show, if that's your, that's your goal, then you've got to just make that happen. And uh, and then things do start to happen. It's like every action has, has uh, you know, it, it, it affects the next action mm -hmm. that'll happen for you. And, and uh, mm -hmm. if you're listening, I hope you're writing this down. There's so much good information coming <laughs> yeah. out. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And well, well, thanks, yeah. If I can just tag yeah. on to that too, I think the idea of starting rather than thinking like, oh, I have to have a solo show. I have to put my own work by itself out there. Yeah. Building on the idea of group shows, yeah, collectives, good. having it and building a network of mm -hmm. people around you is how so much of what the art world decides and pursues gets made. That idea of like building group, building community, building your network, looking at events as opportunities to meet people where you can expand and extend your reach. And I think there's a, a way of doing that without it feeling like slimy business card trading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and again, a lot of that falls back to curiosity. When I meet people, I want to know what they do. I want to know what they're interested in. And then if there's an opportunity to talk about our own work or, or how we could integrate into that community or complement that community, mm -hmm building that bridge is really brilliant <coughs> but uh, also what's really cool or what strikes me is that both of you also have uh, great confidence which uh, as an artist like i can see how some people can struggle with that because you you know you're talking about whether being a go-getter or um, we we're both just making faces <laughs> yeah. uh, i don't like, know if it's <laughs> confidence okay well it, it is there it seems like you believe in your work a lot and not only it's admirable but i can see how that paired up with the uh, you know want to get your art out there very great combination and actually what you were talking about um last week as well which i think we should touch on is how once you build that tribe or the community that it keeps uh, stressing on is that then you start uh, passing around opportunities because not everyone can take on everything but uh, as we yes. mentioned before it feels so good to yes. not be able to do something but then you can give it to your friend who's totally. the next studio next door yeah. yeah yeah i had that happen to me actually in march i was <laughs> it didn't actually end up happening for the person that I offered <laughs> it to, but, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I have a, a number of artists in town that I, um, uh, kind of crush on in a way, because I don't really know them very well, but I like, like what they're doing or, you know, I'm watching what they're up to, you know, because I, I, I admire them. I think they're talented. And so there's a few of them around town that I, I do that with that I don't know, but, um, I was offered a job or asked to you know to put in a proposal for a job and and uh i didn't i didn't i couldn't do it at the the moment so then i just passed it off to like three possible people that i thought i know are hardworking, i know could do the job and uh yeah mm -hmm. and actually you know the more that happens <clears throat> i think that's the way that's the way i'm going to function in this community is that if I can't do something, then I always, you know, whenever I bring clients into the arts factory, I, w I show them my work, but then mm -hmm. I walk them around and show them the work of the artists that are in there. Because what I ultimately believe is that when people want to purchase a piece of art, they're looking for a piece of art for their specific 
situation, whether it's a business or uh, their home or they're trying to style, you know, an apartment or I don't know, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. or are curating, that if they don't like my work, then there's no way that I'm going to be able to change that or, you know, if I'm hiding other people's work from them, (laughs) I'm not going to make them like my work more. (laughs) So... The work has to speak for itself, and that's just like a simple fact. If you need, and if you can just deal with that, um, if people don't like it, that's okay. Uh, so whenever somebody comes in that is interested, that is in the position where they can buy something or make, you know, an art, you know, support the arts, then I take them around to my studio mates and say, "Look at this amazing stuff! Like she's doing this, and he's doing that, and..." Um, and I do that a lot. I do that with every person that comes through because if the opportunity doesn't come to me because they don't find the right fit, that's okay. You know, um, they may find somebody else in the studio to be like what they're looking for. And, th- and it ultimately that is good for everybody, I mm-hmm. think. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I totally try to do that with the people that I'm around. I also yeah. feel very proud that I know those people. It's like you're walking around yeah. and showing girls work. Oh, yeah, I'm friends with this guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm friends with them. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, I've had a chance to talk to them about their work and they do amazing <laughs> stuff. And yeah, you know, it's really cool. Yeah. yeah because you re- you recognize, like, I did the mural festival last year, yeah. which was amazing for me because um, I'd never worked that big before and it was, uh, you know, a huge learning curve. So, it's of course, that's exciting, right? But then being around all those people and getting a chance to talk to them and uh and watch them work was really cool that's why i like the larger medium and the outside uh projects as well for that reason you, you end up communicating so much more as you as you talked before the, the studio can be a lonely pursuit whether it's writing and creating work so mm. there's something about that um speaking of installations uh will you be doing something for this show f- or uh, uh, because so you've done some uh, both of you actually done some murals installations before is there mm-hmm. Just curious, is there going to be something happening this time? Not for Soma, but I am working on a set of Ooh. small <laughs> sculptures and miniatures for an upcoming exhibition out in Maple Ridge. When is that going to be? Um, it'll open up on June 23rd. There you go. There yeah. you go. You gotta, so you Where said, is that, Amy? Yeah. Um, ACT is in Maple Ridge. So it's just off of... They have a really amazing cultural community center that incorporates theater, dance... Uh, visual arts, performing arts, all in one center. So if you go into Maple Ridge's town center, um, mm-hmm. ACT is right there. Nice. Yeah. There you go. So proactive. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you're there, check it out. Okay, well, because I have you here, I, I have to ask these questions. And I'm, because both of you are in, like, you're educators, you're both teachers. And I think, uh, well, I don't know, probably rare to get the perspective of an artist and, and like, from your side. But uh, what I was curious about, um, let me see. Uh, well, actually, first, let's start. How do you think uh, teaching overall has helped you create your art? Mm. Do you want? I well, <laughs> I, I've thought about this a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I teach high school students. So it's actually a, an amazing age because there's so much potential there and there's so much talent. Like, I think yeah. as uh, as adults, we often really undermine or not or under uh, what's the word I'm looking for? like kids kids come out with so much and they're so smart and so talented and we really have to give them opportunities uh, to to mm-hmm. show that um so for me what's cool about how how teaching affects my art practice is that i have to constantly do different things um expose myself to different mediums that i'm not using i'm uh, uh looking at the basics so it's like if you're an athlete you have to, or say you're a dancer, you have to do your plies and your tendus and you have to practice all the basics almost every day in order to practice. And so in a way it constantly gets me to do that. Yeah. And then I'm pushed into mediums that I don't always use in my own practice or, you know, all the time I'm trying new things in teaching. Um, and then I throw it out to 110 kids (laughs) every, every day I teach and Mm. I'm getting back all these answers. So it's like a lab. Wow. So, uh, s- and I'm always telling them I'm learning so much more from you than you ever learned from me <laughs> because I'm getting back all this response and and I'm paying attention. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so I, I tell them about that too. I say, 
look at you know the guy beside you is he making a mistake well wh what's what why is it a mistake like analyze the mistakes if somebody else is making a mistake around you that's them giving you a gift because then mm -hmm. you're able to like um yeah. learn not to do that right so i i just think teaching is a great way to learn about art because you're you're getting a chance to work with a bright people bright mm -hmm. minds mm -hmm. creative people and and um and then you're pushing yourself in areas that you don't normally you're not comfortable in or don't mm -hmm. normally work in all the time and so th i think that's been great for me yeah i think i also see it as a as a real gift i've taken time away from teaching uh over the past year and it's something that i've actually been really excited to come back into oh, nice. yeah it just it it feeds my brain in a way that is tough to find otherwise it's very challenging for mm -hmm. me so a lot of what happens in teaching process, so I'll often be teaching traditional printmaking methods or screen printing. I've also had the opportunity to work with fourth year students who are getting ready to launch themselves out into the larger world. Oh. And then working with grad students as well. So they're at a point where they're really developing their professional careers. And the thing that constantly, regardless of what level the student is at, is that they are asking really exciting questions. If they're <laughs> at school, mm -hmm. the chances are they're invested in being there. And to be able to work with people who are super curious about the medium and who are asking the why questions mm -hmm. constantly. The hard ones. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think like that dialogue is really rich, and that feeds me in a way that I haven't been able to find another way to do and like all part of it too is just like sharing passion and excitement oh, for yeah. the field like being able to introduce new artists to students who maybe have only had a very specific canon as they've been growing up and to be able to also say like okay what are my student demographics like if i've got 70 percent women students traditionally the art canon that they're looking at is going to actually be 70 to 80 percent men if not more so mm -hmm. how do we flip that nice. how do we get the students to look at uh, more marginalized artists that are underrepresented because mm -hmm. that's also I think part of the job of teaching is to mm -hmm. be able to look at what you're offering as an expansion rather than something that just kind of continues to plow the furrow deeper that, that's <laughs> even awesome. in terms of like introducing <laughs> them to new work yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but it's awesome that you're consciously doing that that it's very important and it's probably easy to even forget to yeah, check in those things there must be so many so many aspects to think about what would you um uh, I want to ask you, what would you say, would you say generally when artists graduate, would you say they're prepared for the real world? <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to be really, really honest Please, about this. Yeah, you... Part of w how I teach and what I teach is a response to that because I don't think a lot of artists mm -hmm. are particularly well prepared. I wasn't. Yeah, and I didn't feel that I was for many aspects of my career. I was incredibly well prepared to be a super proficient, technically well-versed printmaker. Um, but in terms of uh, like applying for grants, how to promote work that I'm making, how to make connections in the community, and I would ask questions too. Mm -hmm. Like I'd be like, how did you make this, all this yeah, happen? Yeah, yeah. And often the answers would be really elusive. And I think part of that's buying into the myth of scarcity of opportunity. And I just don't believe in safeguarding that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Like if I know how to write a grant proposal and I can save somebody else from having to do all of the mistakes and the learning that I had to go through to build an understanding of that system, I want to get them on the fast track for that. I just, <coughs> I really right. believe yeah. in that as a part of the pedagogical approach that I take is that you should leave school with a toolkit that is not just about making your work, but being able to put yourself out into the art world successfully to promote what you do and to consider making really well-informed choices. Mm -hmm. Do I want to pursue a commercial career? Is that not something I'm interested in? Yeah. But you can't make those choices if you have no idea what or, either of those fields are. Or offer. how do you bridge both? Yes. Oh, yeah. See, that's I think that's that's a super interesting conversation that's always on the go yeah. too. Yeah. Um, is that I think when you're in academia at art academia, it's very conceptual. There's kind of a, a streamline towards conceptual galleries and that type of. Mm -hmm. Well, Emily Carr was like that for me, anyways. That that, is, that was what was happening. Mm -hmm. Kind of get into that that group of that. That's where you would group yourself. Mm -hmm. And then what if you start to sell work? you yeah. know and just and then having conversations about how how do you do both right oh, yeah. or if you want to do both or how do, how can you 
place yourself in a structure. And sometimes you have to develop that own your own structure, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. there, uh, um, there was a piece of information that I, w I read that Elizabeth Gilbert had in her book, um, Big Magic, which uh, is an easy book to read and there's lots of good tips in there. But um, one of them was um, that she, she believes that you shouldn't ask your creativity to pay your bills. <laughs> and you know, that's interesting. So, yeah. yeah. So, so, and the reason why she does that is that as soon as you ask your creativity to pay your bills, then your creativity is going to change so that it, you're, you're going to be creating work so that, um, people will buy it mm. and that changes maybe your, your flow. But I, I, so I, I think that there's no one answer to the question of where, you know, how, what do you do when you get out of school or where do you go? But, yeah. and, and I think it's, um, a complex issue. But, um, you know, for me, that helped me because I was like, you know what, I'm going, I pay my bills by teaching right now. I have sold work and mm -hmm. I've done pretty well with it actually. But, um, but I, it's good for me personally as an artist to not expect that my work is going to pay the bills because as soon as I do that, I just feel stressed about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, and, and really it functions in my life in a way that, it, it is an intellectual and creative experience for me. That's healthy for me. That's what makes me happy. And so I've had to figure that out for myself where, um, and I think that's something that everyone has to kind of like grapple with a little bit and, and continually grapple with because it changes. Yeah. yeah. And I see how that I wish there was a course or something talked about that specifically. I think even, you know, I work full time and I try to pursue yeah. whether it's illustration or fine art during my free time as well. And it feels like it doesn't feel like it's a norm at least. How do you, how do you say it? Because maybe because it's not talked about as a preferred lifestyle enough, it feels like it's kind of black and white. You either do fine art or you do commercial work. And yeah, but I don't believe that. Neither do I, but yeah. when it's not either spoken about as a norm, but it's spoken like at a transitional point, for example, it's, uh, yeah, it just seems like whether that's education or that dialogue is missing. And once again, I didn't go to, uh, c um, I didn't go to like a fine arts, fine arts school or, or I can see, so I, I was, was not exposed to that at all. My education was very much commercial, <coughs> but when you're speaking about, and this is why I asked that our students, are they prepared for the real world? these kind of lifestyles or even ways of being an artist, it seems like they're not discussed. And this is something that I've spoken with many uh, artists that I know, especially coming out of school. And mm -hmm, you know, the, mm -hmm. the general consensus seems to be, I don't know what I'm doing. What uh, and I mean, part of that too is I don't, I don't know, building on what you're saying, true stuff of there not being one way, I don't know if there's a course that could offer answers yeah. for everyone. <laughs> uh, because you do, I think you have to put in the hard work, you have to put in the hours, you need to make choices, and sometimes you need to make sacrifices. Mm -hmm. um, as Tristess and I were walking here, I was like, I don't know if I'm like a great friend all the time, because <laughs> I, I generally, I prioritize studio, and sometimes like that, that means I can't be as available socially. Um, and so it's also learning about what you are willing and unwilling to sacrifice mm -hmm. and to prioritize. And sometimes I think that choice is also about, uh, do I feel like I need to, to suffer for my work? Do I need to um, oh, yeah. rely so heavily on the sale of my work that I'm unwilling to entertain mm -hmm. any other kind of employment? And for me, I get so much out of the process of teaching that for me, I see it as win-win. As but I think there are lots of ways of building that day or building a structure for yourself that is complementary to what you want to accomplish with your creative career as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're saying if it's impossible to teach every way of, uh, you know, making a living while being an artist, which that's uh, a huge topic on its own. Maybe it's just about being exposed to people who are doing it. Yeah. Having uh, some models and mentors. Yes. Exactly. I think that's probably yes. would be the ideal way because when you, once again, when people come out of school and it's like, well, what my can my life even be what does it look like i yeah. think that just shows that you just didn't see those hundreds of artists that are in your city you just don't know because they're that like are doing in it. studios yeah you know actually i just was having a great conversation with this young talented young man uh that is friends with my brother's uh daughter so he's <laughs> 20 i think he's about 23 anyways he was talking because he's interested in starting his own business or he has started his own business with mm -hmm. two of his friends and they're talented and um and i said so he was saying you know 
he seems like the kind of person that's quite quiet and and um, you know more uh, a person who observes the world mm -hmm. and I said you know the best thing that I've experienced in my life uh, personally is that you need to look at the people who are doing the stuff that you're interested in mm -hmm. and watch their trajectory and mm -hmm. study it like crazy you know find every information you know all information about what they did um, and I was listening to this podcast about mentorship and I forget what it was but um, one of they were talking I think it was hurry slowly but um, they were talking about that mentorship isn't like you know you you go into a firm and you watch somebody it's more like um you know maybe you go and work for free for somebody that you're interested in working with you know like maybe you um you know like this one guy was talking about the fact that he was somebody's um assistant and a writer's assistant and he just watched his daily practice and he worked for free but he's like if you think about it that you're working with somebody that you think is amazing and they have all these talents and they're doing and you're getting to observe them just in their daily life so you see when they sit down to work mm -hmm. when they make their calls um, how it functions on a daily basis you can't pay for that type of mm -hmm. uh, knowledge right so so in a lot of ways I I think there's so much information out there like it you know I constantly am looking for myself. I, I constantly look to all types of artists. So I just listened to this amazing conversation with Jack White and Conan O'Brien <laughs> online about, you know, their process. One's mm -hmm. a comedian, one's a, um, a rock star, but yeah. they, but just like the way that they've, they're both super hardworking people and what, how they deal with creative decisions. And just like, so I, I've, I am constantly looking for creative people who are discussing their process on a day-to-day mm -hmm. -day basis, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. And yeah, you, uh, you have to be yeah, hardworking for sure, I guess, when you get to that level. Yeah, I don't uh, think that's a negotiable. No, no like I just, I just yeah, don't, especially <laughs> in this particular or area. In fact, you have to be extra hardworking, especially yeah. if it's, you know, you don't have eight hours a day to put into the craft. You better be very smart with your hours. And I'm sure you can relate to that. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I like the idea that people set time every day or five times a week to do the thing that they're going to do you know like whatever it is that they're working on so if it's music or you know filmmaking or visual art or whatever you know you just you go and sit in your space and you tinker away right <laughs> and yeah. then and then you know just you can't help it but stuff starts to happen totally it's magic like that <laughs> <What> <laughs> <are you? laughs> I, I wanted to ask what would um, are there any obstacles that you run into as a teacher in when what way <laughs> oh, that, well, so, so many uh, however <laughs> I want, but once again I, I don't think we uh, generally yeah as an art uh, as artists so I don't know like as students you, you, want, <laughs> you seem to get just one side you know what I mean so I hope this is a good opportunity to hear from the teachers and uh, if they're like what maybe the way our society faces it or yeah I mean you let me know I can I can maybe start um, with a couple of examples um, sometimes attitude is an obstacle mm -hmm. um, and so <laughs> part of no way Amy <laughs> shut up come on it's hardest no attitude um, in a way I see some of my job uh, when I'm teaching as unpeeling what appears from the outside to be very <laughs> sound <laughs> opinions. Um, and I think part of that is also just, it's what we were talking about a while ago, that idea of training yourself to look sideways. Mm -hmm. So if you're only making work that you know the intention of, you know the destination of, you know exactly how it's going to look, it's finished before you engage with the process. Um, and so one of the challenges that I see with teaching a lot or the, the boundaries that we push up against is just how to build an open attitude mm -hmm. um, and how to pay attention and how to look, <laughs> yeah. to look very closely. I think closely. we're all struggling with those. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. That's life syllabus yeah. stuff totally. for me, too. Um, the other thing, uh, just to be like very pragmatic about some of this, I find class size challenging. Mm. Um, part of that is to do with enrollment and institutional agenda, but it's really hard to have great, meaningful time uh, to chat with students 
especially if we're getting into some of the the later years mm -hmm. in their education, um, I want to sit down and have a meaty chat and get to know them and their work. And it's hard when you're dealing with 20 students yeah. and a very limited yeah. amount of time. Yeah. Have you compared it to any other education systems outside of Canada? Oh, there's so many models. Yeah. Um, there's... Uh, not to get too specific or, or in the weeds with it, but I think there are ways of dealing with classroom dynamics where um, particularly European models uh, for schooling are a little bit less hands-off in terms of classroom attendance mm -hmm. and the interaction between mentor and mentee is prioritized. Nice. So it's more studio visits, it's much more self-initiated by the artists or students themselves. They seek out mentors, they seek out people that they want to bring into their studio. And I actually think that's a very interesting mm -hmm. model that encourages people to be much more self-reliant. That's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you, Tristan? Well, as a, I think Amy and I have a quite a different experience as teachers because she teaches in post-secondary and I teach in high school. But in high school, the thing that is most frustrating for me is that kids move from, you know, young adults move from, in, in my particular situation, they move from, uh, you know, math to biology to English to art. Mm -hmm. And then it rotates yeah. around. And then one day they're, they're talking about you know, f physics, and then they move into math, and then they move into, you know, um, the outside, or not the outside is a great eight book, but, you know, they're, then they're talking about literature, and then I get them, and, and they're exhausted. Their brains have been <laughs> jumping around all day, and then the next day, they do four different subjects, and it's great because they're getting this, uh, you know, they're getting a whole education, they're getting the holistic education, and there's so much good work that's being done, but I also think that that structure is difficult for them and difficult for me because if I look at my workflow and the way that I work best uh, when I'm on my own or working with one or two people, um, I come in, I, it takes me like 45 minutes to set up and get ready. Mm -hmm. And then I work for like four hours mm -hmm. and then I take a break or whatever, you know? Yeah. But it's like this longer, um, a timetable and I think for me the challenge right now in high school is that we have kids in like hour hour and 15 minute blocks jumping from one intellectual pursuit to another creative pursuit to athletics and and it's great all of these things are I think there's great things happening in each of those subject areas but the I think the bouncing around is challenging and you mm. often see children or and adults just feeling totally burnt out That's mm -hmm. very or, or they just yeah. shut down like, you know how you are, if you're listening to, uh, if you are if you go to see a speaker talk, um, you kind of can pick up like maybe five things from oh, them. Yeah, yeah. And then you start to just like zone out and start thinking about your, your day or what <laughs> you need to do. And, and so I think in a lot of ways, we bombard students in our education system. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like that's my big, biggest, biggest obstacle. Mm. It, so, and the other thing about teaching is that it's a performance and um, takes energy, yes. and at a, and and I work so I in my in my work life as a teacher I do four classes in a row. So on the fourth class I'm not as good as I was, mm -hmm. you know. So I think um, learning how to dole out my energy more evenly is a good idea, and a allowing students to have space. So I don't know. Like most often, like my the the, the kids that are coming into my cl school are amazing. Um, I find them. You know, in general, and I don't like to generalize because they're all so different, but, you know, kids that are even struggling or not really interested in my subject area, like, they're cool people. <laughs> and, they, you know, I'm, I feel pretty blessed to be in the job that I have, but, uh, and to be working with so many amazing uh, educators. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not perfect and it, it never will be. Oh, yeah. I think yeah, that's, course. I think yeah. that we're, I think in, in high school education, that goal is to continue to try to make it better, yeah, yeah. but that it, it never can be like this perfect situation because you're dealing with so many different aspects of like personalities, institutions, um, you know, abilities mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and people. So it's like a huge ship that you're moving in, you're working within. So that's, that's, I would say, you know, like that's always mm -hmm. going to be the obstacle. But do you find, is there, enough value being placed on art at that level because you're you know you're talking about all these subjects and but mm -hmm. is 
art. Yeah, is it? Oh, I think it's like the best subject ever. <laughs> but what I'm saying, like, uh, let's say you know, in the in the school, like in high school system, do you feel like does it have an equal stand with oh. all the other subjects? That's what I mean. Oh, Oof. that's a, that's mean, political. Oh yeah, um, of but course. no, yeah. it isn't. <laughs> like, so when I was when I was hired as a art teacher, I you know graduated from Emily Carr and I was hired, and um, I was bumped out of my job by somebody who was in business education. Um, and, and then the Dean at the time, Ingrid Koenig of Emily Carr wrote, cause I was teaching her son. She wrote a letter to the school board and said, you're undermining arts education because you're hiring somebody to teach art that isn't educated in art. And, mm-hmm. and that was a huge, you know, I was like, well, that's so true. Yeah. Like yeah. I wasn't going to get, you know, bumped out of my position and placed in math. <laughs> yeah. Or no, and that's the uh, yeah. that reverse logic it would never sense, yeah. apply. No, and so and so at that point I really realized that this is a political arena. Mm-hmm. Like so I one of my major goals in in teaching has always been to educate students about how they consume art all the time and art makes their lives better. Yeah. Yeah. Like as music, you know, film, video games. You know, people use these things and it, in it, you know, music. Like, mm-hmm. can you imagine your life without yeah. music? Yeah. Can you imagine your life without um, a piece of art that <laughs> changed it in mm-hmm. some way that you saw and you realized that there was potential in the world that, you know, it just, it, these things expand, you know, art always expands our universe, makes us think outside of ourselves, connects us to other people. Totally. It's like all these super, super important um, relationship building qualities to art that connect us to our to connect us to our humanity. And so I try to teach my students to acknowledge the fact that these things are important and they're mm-hmm. valuable, but they're also kind of like air what we just assume that they're <laughs> just there right take it for mm. granted yeah exactly. that's why i was asking it even just the, the idea of teaching creative thinking because you know clearly not everyone's going to be an artist uh you yeah. know, pursue i understand mm-hmm. that but whether i don't know if design thinking can be taught um as early or just like uh, you know putting seeds of what design thinking is or creative thinking because that's incredibly valuable you know in, in yeah. any field no matter what it is and I've been thinking about this more, you know, it's a different conversation, but as AIs and, you know, robotics and computers are going to be eventually, you know, slowly but surely taking over what they can't replicate is or won't be able to. Like the last thing that will be re- replicated is creative thinking or creativity because that's like the hardest thing to harness um, for, you know, through like for AI. They can, you know, if they, mm-hmm. you tell them to make a box, they can make a box, but... Amy, this th- seems to be up your alley. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We're talking about, about your theme, <laughs> art, artwork theme. But is th- th- this is the kind of stuff I think about, you know, when uh, yeah, when you're speaking about art or creativity in general. Like the well, value of it is going to be more and more. If Yeah. yeah I mean, that's so – that whole – that is a super <laughs> interesting a topic. topic. Yeah. Like um, uh, we were talking about the ethics of, of that. Like programmers are programming into, you know, cars that drive themselves. Like – if you are going to hit something, you know, and you have the choice between, and this is programmed into the yeah, car, yeah. that to the choice between a tree, a kid, and an old person, or a black person, like those kind of ethics are being programmed into, yeah. you know, like it's super interesting, it's like a that fascinating subject. that whole mm. yeah f- going down that route, like <laughs> what it means to be a creative thinker, like and how you might put that into a machine mm-hmm. and morals and philosophy and all that it's just like yeah wow that's yeah. a huge and i think it's getting away from us i mean we <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> wait, sorry <laughs> no no um, like uh, that that field overall like the ethics of it are a little falling behind it seems like because everything else is advancing so quickly but i mean that's mm-hmm. that is a topic for us <laughs> yeah it is okay <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so I, I love all this stuff it's really fascinating it, it is yeah. Did, uh, i don't know if i if you had anything to add or you're oh i was just thinking about um like bringing it back to the idea of of education and mm-hmm. and how you're uh, how we uh, are operating within a structure uh, when you're teaching that prizes or values um, answers and deliverables. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of the language uh, yes. that's built yeah. into how education functions. Um, even how I apply for teaching jobs has shifted and changed over the last 10 years because uh, the hiring panel wants to know 
um, if I'm talking to them about my research, um, it's framed within the language of science as opposed to art, where mm. it's like, what is your studio practice like? They want to know what my research plan is. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's some of those... Um, it, it sort of takes our conversation a bit meta, but if we could shift the paradigm of that from looking solely as education as a way to build a path towards deliverables, if we could flip that and say that education is a way to build skills for curiosity, for me, that would yeah, be a much amen. more <laughs> exciting way to look at things. And that's, I think, also why art sometimes is not valued at the same level as, say, going to biology class or, mm -hmm. or taking your physics because it is a field of curiosity and so you cannot guarantee deliverables yeah and this is why it's hard to uh, to prove that it is tangible because you know that like you said people want to see results so yeah. in that in that area it's very hard to kind of take it to the end and say like oh here is exactly where you're going to get because that's unfortunately that's not how it works but yeah. also fortunately like it, it, you're going to get really unexpected uh, of results and the outcomes of education, I guess, in that way. But I, I, I read an article about how a lot of post-secondary institutions or, or businesses were saying that, you know, I'm getting these people graduated from post-secondary institutions that can't think outside the box, that yeah. aren't able to problem solve. Mm -hmm. And, and I think art is all about doing that. I think, I think, um, so th what the, the businesses and, um, you know, people who are hiring <laughs> people for jobs uh, is are saying to post-secondary institutions like we need you to give real life problems and that there isn't mm -hmm. an outcome at the end of it you know get people to yeah. practice that and I think art is great for that because it's like yeah you're sort of trying to figure out what you are trying to do you know uh, often or you you'll give criteria and then you're trying to get there and uh, the, the process of getting there is like where it gets juicy totally <laughs> right and um, and I think that's th there's a I think if you can do arts, the art you know visual art or any type of art education, in in conjunction with s science, there's so many similarities. And I think people who are working at the, uh, the 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 kind of top end of these you know working on big problems, they see these connections all the time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the process of thinking. And, and when you're at a younger level or when you're at a, a more rudimentary level, you don't see those connections all the time. And I think th maybe those big ideas need to be introduced early. So yeah. these mm -hmm. are the exciting things, you know? Well, in those silos, I think of like saying, oh, art is over here yeah, and math is over here. It, it is, and it benefits the institution. It never benefits the student. It rarely benefits the educator or the mm -hmm. teacher. And I think the areas where we can see more cross-pollination are super exciting. Yeah. This is such a huge topic. I, I feel like you could just yeah. Yeah, I mean, go for hours. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just no, it's, think, yeah. it's so exciting. It is. But um, it's difficult. Yeah. yeah no, I've, I've been interested in uh, connecting art to sciences and particularly math. Uh, and math, uh, you know, just full disclosure, I am terrible at math in a lot of ways. <laughs> but um, I like thinking about big ideas. Mm -hmm. And so if you bring somebody, like uh, what I do is I have tried to work with people who really know a lot about math and uh, and then we meet and, and that's when magic nice. happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and actually... I think it's good as an educator to show your students that you don't know all the answers that you're facility facilitating like the thinking around it um, that um, that we're going to try to work to yeah. towards this because yeah. I've had kids in my class that they just you know they'll have some passion in an, a subject area and they know so much more than me <laughs> and that often happens with computers yeah. and they bring so much to the the table and you just let them do that yeah Cool. All right, let's bring it back to okay. you. I feel like we dove, okay, dove sorry. pretty deep into it. No, no, <laughs> yeah. no, but uh, I, I want to, let's, uh, no, that was really fascinating, but uh, I think we got to learn about m you a lot more <laughs> as well. So I, uh, yeah, the way I always mention this, the way I do this, I write down a bunch of questions on how the conversation is going to go and it always ends up being better than what I planned. <laughs> but okay. I'll, I'll bring it back a little bit. So one thing I wanted to know, when, uh, it's, uh, well, often like it, interesting qu uh, answers come out of this question is uh, when did you feel like you're a professional artist hmm. i think i'm that is it, we brought up the idea of life syllabus before i think that's like constantly in progress mm -hmm. um <laughs> just to be 
I know that's a bit of an elusive answer, but um, part of it is also understanding that professionalism doesn't just magically happen one day Mm -hmm. where you're like, oh, I got this grant or I had this (laughs) show. And that certainly helps to build confidence towards professionalism. But that's something that for me is never, I don't ever feel like that's complete. That's very surprising to me. You seem very professional. I thank you. (laughs) She is. I'll I'll take that as a compliment. Um, Yeah, I just, I don't know if there's, uh, I think if there were only one end goal, if it was like, okay, professionalism would Mm. mean this, that you'd also have to, for me, I would have to answer the question of like, if I achieve that, what next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I can, yeah, I see that. Um, I mean, there's, I've had some wonderful opportunities that I think have helped me build an understanding of professionalism and a lot of learning. I feel like I'm at a moment, maybe um, now more than in the past, I do feel like I've got a good toolkit for a lot of the scenarios that I'm encountering. The other thing that I think is maybe a nice marker of professionalism is that I don't pull all-nighters anymore. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That yes. you're watching your health. <laughs> taking that that into there's consideration. There's just a little bit of balance in there. Yeah. Like not not stressing myself out or pushing my schedule to the point of where it is not sustainable yeah, yeah, yeah. or tenable. Good lesson. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I was just listening to Amy's answer is a very good one. So I would agree with that w- answer. But I also think like the Canada Council looks at, you know, you sometimes you have to look at what um, our our peers, our um, professionals in the arts community are saying. So Mm -hmm. one of the things they say is that I think you have to have three shows, uh, art shows within a three year period. Yeah, that are uh, peer juried. So it has to be something that you've applied for Mm -hmm. and received um, an acceptance. Yeah, so the- Getting a nod of approval from the community. Yeah, yeah, well you're vetted. Yeah. Through, uh, yeah, the the, uh, professionals around you. And I think that's very important too, in, in a way, because it's a valuing that people who are educated and working in those fields. So have you already done that? Uh, have I yeah. reached that point? I don't know if I've been in peer evaluated. I'm not sure if I have been. Um, Gotta find I, out if you're professional. You know what? I actually, <laughs> I feel like I've done a lot of my own, you know, I've created a lot of my own opportunities and then I've had people come and find me in the business community and which is which is interesting so that's like you know i've had success with the business community and maybe not so much with the like conceptual artist community mm-hmm. right <clears throat> and um and that's okay like mm. i i actually think that i am a professional artist at this point um if you asked me that like three years ago i probably would have said mm-hmm. interesting and you know i think that there's i think that th- that's a you know i came i started a bit later in terms of like really pursuing it actively in my life because i've been a teacher and um so yeah so for me i've had a bit of a different trajectory than somebody who came right out of art school and just went for it like i just couldn't afford to do it mm-hmm. when i came out of art school like there's no way i could have done that mm-hmm. um and so I've kind of, you know, like my path has been a lot more squiggly line than straight, which I think is common for a lot of people. But yeah, mm-hmm. I would say now I'm a professional artist. Very cool. It's good to hear. <laughs> it's It sucks because we're... Uh, Out of time. Almost. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, it's like I'm, maybe we could have done like a, you know, for our podcast, maybe get no. through <laughs> <laughs> uh, too, much, too much to talk about. I know you got to paint. So let me, uh, I guess I'll uh, throw a couple of questions at you before we... Uh, have to wrap it up because I really want to talk about the business of art, but I think we touched a bit on that. I think we, I think we, this is very, uh, turned out to be very well rounded by you initiating these conversations. It was cool. Uh, so let's, uh, let me grab uh, a couple of different ones. Um, let's see. Any, uh, what's the biggest failures? Biggest oh. failure? Sorry, I'm just, there's a, there's a catalog <laughs> to run through there. I don't want to take your um, mind there. Actually, no, it's, funny. A, it's actually really, um, I enjoy looking at those moments now that there is distance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I think there's been m- moments where I've really just not allowed enough time. Mm. Time is always super challenging for me um, in that I, I need deadlines in order to be able to like deliver a work mm-hmm. <laughs> um, because otherwise I would keep noodling at it forever and ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I've had some moments where things did not get made 
the way I would like them to or that I did not feel as confident about the work that I was putting forward because I ran into time. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, that's a super interesting question. Um, I think this year, one of my biggest failures was that I had um, two, I had two big jobs that happened like right after each other. And Mm. I wish if I looked back on it, I was exhausted when I finished them, <laughs> like really like because I have children and a job and I, yeah. you know, I was really tired. So I think one of the things that I am looking at now to to do better is that give myself a little recuperation time and know yeah. that if somebody really wants to work with me, they'll wait a week yeah. until I r- recuperate and not not to just keep going and burning myself out because I did burn out, mm-hmm. I think. And I had to like, um, you know, it took me a lot longer to recover. And I think if I just take, okay, well, I've just done this huge job, take some time to just regenerate because creativity is extra energy. Like, you know, you have to have some energy to be creative. So, Mm -hmm. so I think it's, it's important to not, um, to not grasp and cling to the idea that you have to keep going in order for (laughs) it to be successful. You need to like, make sure that you put something back in the tank. So that would be, I think that was my big lesson. And then in terms of artwork, like, when I was making work for this show, there was some there was some work that came out that I was like, wow, like <laughs> laughing at, like gut yeah. gut like gut laughing, mm, crying about, sure. you know, like where I was <laughs> just like, there. oh my gosh, there. this is terrible, you know. <laughs> but um, and, you know, and I was showing it to Julia, and she was laughing at me too. So like, you know, I think there's like recognizing that you make a lot of mistakes, yeah. totally, and that you, you gotta let yourself do that, and you know, and not everybody's gonna love it, yeah, and that's yeah. okay. That's very good. But uh, yeah, knowing yourself and because I think we drive ourselves quite a bit, especially with creativity and art. Mm-hmm. You just want to keep going. But I, I'm struggling with that. I'm trying to learn what, what you're about, what you're talking about with the pace. Yeah. And like, yeah, I think yeah. that's so important because yeah. ultimately we're human and we need. Uh, well, it's just like we need to have downtime in yes. order to be creative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like there's so much that's like having a good night's sleep. You wake up the next day and you're like, OK, I'm down. Let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. But if you continually push yourself where you're running on adrenaline, yeah. like that's a huge problem for our whole world right now. But I think that I think particularly as an artist, it's important to allow yourself some downtime. All right. And yeah. uh, last one and my <coughs> favorite. What advice? What advice would you give yourself? just before you went to post-secondary oh shit mm. to your younger self went just before you went to post-secondary about art or life <laughs> uh, anything <laughs> let's see where this takes us oh my God. i think i would have maybe um i took school so seriously like so seriously <laughs> no it um <laughs> it was a good thing and it's not to say that i didn't i didn't have fun um but i think one of the survival mechanisms that i've built in this career over the last 10 or 15 years has been to not take myself so seriously mm-hmm. um, that everything isn't a live or die decision that there's <laughs> there's yeah. room to make mistakes it, it took me a long time to really embrace the idea of risk and chance and failure and they're incredibly fruitful tools mm-hmm. but if you're so afraid of risk or failure <laughs> that you never take a chance that is paralyzing and I think going into post-secondary, I was used to ma- like being quite good within the very tiny high school pool of art mm-hmm. making, yeah. and then being like, "Oh, everybody's really good," <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and just be like having to check the ego a little bit, and just being and learning that over and over again of just coming to the table with the best you have to offer with very little expectation but a lot of hope mm-hmm. and that would have been really great advice <laughs> <laughs> at so that time t- listen up people getting gold all right yeah. <laughs> i think i was probably a completely different student than amy <laughs> <laughs> did you take it too easy is that the oh <laughs> i like the first thing that came to mind was like don't drink and smoke so much maybe that's like, good advice not, don't be such an alcoholic um <laughs> but actually um, I would say uh, to myself at 21 that I would say to that person to allow yourself to make mistakes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like really just rec- like it's so I keep saying this, but it's so much about like I think when we get embarrassed about our mistakes, it's because we our ego so attached to it that we feel like mm-hmm. people are judging us or whatever. But yeah. I would say play your cards and allow yourself to make mistakes. 
That's very good. And it's been, I think that's been the constant theme actually throughout our conversation, which I found, yeah. uh, and it's for a reason. It's because to really learn from them and like, be, I guess, being humble and human with it and maybe stepping aside from it is, well, is very cha you're challenging. Not, it's not, you know, just being able to step back yeah. from your, your insecurity. I think, yeah. I think uh, I, that played a big part of my, uh, in, in my life as a 20 something person, which it's sad because I think you spend a lot of energy kind of worrying about that. But, um, you know, like, like I said, life is short and it's so important to, to allow yourself to be curious and, yeah. and go for it. Wow. That was incredible. I, yeah, that was so good. All I had to, all I had to do was just kind of get out of the way and let you two <laughs> chat and teach you things. That was amazing. Uh, Thank you so much for your time. Oh, just Ilya, so much for hosting us. Really? Yeah. I feel yeah. so flattered to be here and that you would yeah, even I feel care. very flattered. No, that's <laughs> honestly, like I, I, more of this kind of information needs to be shared and you two are very experienced and I think there's so much knowledge and value and, you know, I hope you continue Thank educating you. and spreading all the good uh, knowledge and wealth. Thank you. Uh, so um, let's do it this way. Uh, let us know, uh, let the listeners know how to find you. And then I'll uh, quickly mention the show and everything else before I wrap up. For sure. Um, so if folks are interested in looking at Amy Henny Brown's work, they can visit my website, uh, amybrown.ca, A-I-M-E-E-B-R-O-W-N.ca. Um, or you can find me on Instagram at Amy Henny Brown. Go find her. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm at www dot tristess seeliger t-r-i-s-t-e-s-s-e-s-e-e-l-i-g-e-r -E 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 com nice. and my instagram is at missy trissy that's right go find them and they got an art show coming up uh called in situ uh, am i saying it right in situ in situ so it's a softer t okay there you go I, i'll continue learning and it's an uh four uh artist uh show with uh alongside uh julia croats and jesse mcneil along with Tristess and Amy, and it's going to be June 2nd to July 1st, opening, let's see, Saturday, 3 p.m., right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. are you also doing a talk? Do you know when that's happening? Yes. Yeah, we have a talk on June 16th, which is also a Saturday at 3 p.m. And nice. I believe all four of us will are be, gonna be there at yeah. the talk. Yeah. Okay, so do not miss out because, you know, th this was incredible. I can only yeah. imagine how much when you're going to get very deep into the artwork at uh, the show. So I'll make sure to see you there. I guess for uh, everyone listening, uh, I well, I hope you enjoyed all the background noises that we had during the show. <laughs> I think the baby kind of helped make the show. I think it was <laughs> great. <laughs> also, don't forget today's the last day to uh, submit your application to the South Main Gallery for the open call. And uh, as we've mentioned before. Summer 7. Yeah, incredible opportunity. So do not miss out. If uh, you want to hear more about Creative Theory Podcast, uh, find us on Instagram and Facebook under that said name. I throw videos now on YouTube as well if it's easier for you. Otherwise, if you're missing your art dose, Snackcast is going to be from 2 to 4. Thanks for listening and uh, I appreciate you. Have a good one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.